Hey everybody, this is Jeff Butts from the Mac Observer, and you are watching Terminal Tinkering. This is the podcast where I play around with older Macs, make newer Macs do things that maybe they weren't supposed to, and tinker with electronics. In this episode, we're going to look at how to set up third-party drivers on your Hackintosh. We'll talk about installing unsigned apps on a Mac, and then we'll dig into Unix on your Mac and look at installing and setting up ports in FreeBSD. So let's get started and talk about how to set up third-party drivers on your Hackintosh. Now, third-party drivers for a Mac OS system are called KEXTS. That's K-E-X-T-S. And they stand for kernel extensions. Now, there are a lot of ways you can find KEXTS. You can Google for them when you need them. Uh, you can go on Reddit and look for them there. But one of the largest collections I found of third-party drivers for a Hackintosh is a website called Insanely Mac, which you've heard me refer to before. Now, when you look for your driver, you need to know what type of, what type of driver you need. For example, if you know that your motherboard has an Atheros E2200 Ethernet, that's the driver you want to download. Insanely Mac does require that you be logged in in order to download anything. I've already logged in. I'll go ahead and download this, even though I don't have this particular chipset. I'll walk you through the, the stage to install it up until the point where I actually install it. Now, what you need when it comes time to install one of these is you need a way to manage the, the kext file. And you could try to do that manually, but I found that's usually a bad idea. So what you need is a kext installation tool and I use Kext Util or Kext Utility. And here it is on Insanely Mac. Latest Kext Utility version 2.6.6. .6. Says it's for Mac OS 10.5 to 10.12, but it works fine under High Sierra as well. So we'll go ahead and download the latest version of that, which is 2.6.6. .6. And I'll include the link to this in the show notes. I actually already have the tool installed in my applications folder, Kext Utility. I launch it. It asks for my user, for my uh, administrative password. So I'll type that in. The first thing it does is repair the permissions in system library extensions, as well as library extensions. This is just the normal thing. Depending on how fast your computer is, it may take a few minutes to finish. Once it's done, then you're able to go ahead and install your driver. So I've unzipped my driver file. I go to release because that's how this particular zip file is set up. And there's my kext file. This is a kernel extension file. It contains all of the drivers that are needed for the Atheros E2200 Ethernet card. I see the Kext utility is about done. And it's done. And I could have done this already, but I find that sometimes Kext utility gets confused if you rush it. Drag files on window to process them. So I just take my, take my file, drag it on top of Kext utility, it says it wants to make changes, asks for my username and password. I'm going to cancel. In your case, you would type in your password, click on OK, and Kext Utility would do its thing and install the driver. So let's go ahead and show that again. It's really not going to hurt anything for me to install that. I launched Kext Utility. Authenticate. Let it repair permissions. Okay, it's done repairing permissions for library extensions and system library extensions. So I take my kext file, drag it onto kext utility, give it my password. It 
It installs that Kext file into system library extensions. Kext Utility automatically figures out where's the best place to put these files. In this case, it's slash system, slash library, slash extensions. It installs the file, repairs permissions, updates the system cache files, syncs the, the disk cache, and then it's done. Then I can just click on quit, and that's all she wrote. Now, the next time I boot up my computer, the Atheros E2200 drivers will load if I have that hardware in my computer, and I'll be able to use that Ethernet port. If you look on Insanely Mac, you'll find that they have a wide range of third-party drivers. Uh, let me go back there. 264, in fact, various drivers. Divided up into graphics cards, audio, LAN and wireless, and other. Now, the one thing that's different here is the NVIDIA web drivers. For those, you will have a package file that you install, and it is very much tied to your to what version of macOS you're running. So if you have third-party NVIDIA beta web drivers for Sierra, they will not work with High Sierra. You must have the drivers for High Sierra. Since I'm not running NVIDIA, I'm honestly not sure if they've even come out yet. Let's do a quick search. We'll do a search. Looks like the latest Quadrant GeForce drivers came out on September 27th. And it says it's for macOS High Sierra. So yes, they are available for High Sierra. So if you have the GeForce 600 series, 200 series, 100 series, the GeForce 8, Quadro, or Quadro FX, or various other NVIDIA drivers, this is what you'll need for High Sierra. Just Google that. I'll include this link in the show notes as well, just so you have it. It's, it's important to have if you're running NVIDIA on your, on your Hackintosh. So that takes care of installing third-party drivers. So now let's look at what do you need to do in order to run a, an app that is by an unsigned developer. And we'll be right on with that. Okay, so when you install an app from that's an unsigned app, this basically means the developer who created that app did not, does not have a registered Apple developer account. Now, as you might have heard in recent times, a, an exploit came out called Keychain Stealer, and this takes advantage of permissions that it gets when you allow an unsigned app to run. With that in mind, be very careful when you're installing and running an unsigned app. Make sure you know what it's going to do. Make sure you know who it comes from, that it's from a reliable source, and that it's vetted. And the way you do that is by reading forum posts, by reading the Hackintosh subreddit, and just making yourself informed, or any subreddit related to Macs and unsigned apps. You don't want to get a Trojan or any form of malware on your Mac. Now, with that said, when you try to run an app that is not signed, an, an app by an unregistered developer or an unsigned app, you're going to get a message that says that the app can't be opened because it is from an unidentified developer. Your security preferences allow installation of only apps from the App Store and identified developers, and then it'll tell you when you downloaded the file. I'll click on OK. The way to get around this is through the security preferences in system preferences, security and privacy preferences. In previous versions of macOS, we didn't have to go through this. We could choose to install unsigned apps and they would get past Gatekeeper just fine. We could turn Gatekeeper off, basically. Apple has done away with that ability. Now our choices are allow apps downloaded from the App Store or allow apps downloaded from the App Store and identified developers. 
if we run across an app that is not by an identified developer, then we have to go into security and privacy under system preferences and click on open anyway. We'll get a message that asks if we're sure we want to open it. Click on open and that will allow you to run the app. You only have to do that one time. If I run that app again, it doesn't ask me. It doesn't prompt me, it doesn't do anything, everything's fine. My recommendation is don't use unsigned apps unless you absolutely have to. There is too much risk, uh, too, too much of a chance that you could get malware on your system. And even though malware for the Mac is very rare, it is brutal. It is vicious. And you don't want to mess with it. So if you have to, and as Hackintosh users, we often have to. We don't have any choice because the tools that we need to use to make our Hackintosh run are not by registered developers. So use caution, but if you know that it's a, a decent app or by a reputable developer, just because they don't give $99 a year to Apple doesn't mean they're trying to infect your computer. They may have their own reasons for not doing that, and sometimes you just have to go with it. Once again, Gatekeeper is there for a reason. It is there to protect you. Now, let's look at how you can change what apps are allowed. You click that lock icon down in the bottom left corner of the screen, and it'll ask you for your password. At that point, you can tell it to allow apps from only from the App Store or from the App Store and identified developers. Once again, identified developers are developers who have registered developer accounts with Apple. Apple knows who they are. They digitally sign all of their apps. And if they are if they are found to be in violation of any of Apple's terms and conditions, they lose their registration. They lose their ability to be identified developers. And quite frankly, this is why a lot of the apps that we use on Hackintosh have to be by unidentified developers because the apps are bypassing parts of Mac OS that Apple doesn't allow you to bypass. And therefore, the developers behind those apps can't keep their registrations valid. They can't sign their apps. Therefore, the app shows up as being unsigned and you have to take steps accordingly. So if you have any questions about this, um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. You can email me at jeffb at macobserver.com or you can reach out to me on Twitter as at Clefmeister. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions I can regarding signed versus unsigned apps, anything that's not clear in this. The long story short is, yes, you can run unsigned apps. Sometimes you have to, but if you don't have to, don't do it. Don't do it just to get out of spending a few bucks. Don't do it just to get an app that you don't need, but you think sounds really cool. Do it only in instances where you have to. So with that said, let's move on to installing ports in FreeBSD. So ports is a collection of bundles of files, actually. It's a, the official definition says it's a collection of make files, patches, and description files. What it does is it allows you to compile and install applications ranging from network utilities to development tools to the entire X11 graphical user interface. So let's look at how we can get port snap, how we can get the ports tree set up and running. And to do that, I'll go ahead and log into the ancient one.
And I'll need to do this as SU. Now, when you're first setting up ports for the very first time, and I've already done this before, so I'm just gonna type in the commands and then I'll tell you what they do. Port snap fetch will reach out to the mirror, for, to the FreeBSD mirror. It will download a compressed snapshot of the ports collection into slash var slash db slash port snap. What it will then do is it will verify the integrity of the snapshot, make sure that the keys match up. It will generate a key to it, download a file, download a copy of the ports collection, and then use that key to verify the integrity. After you've finished the port snap fetch process, then you'll run port snap extract. And when that finishes, you'll have a complete collection of the ports available categories, files, just about anything you can think of that's available for FreeBSD, you'll be able to compile straight from ports. Periodically, you'll want to update your port snap tree. In order to do that, you'll type port snap fetch update and that will download a new copy of of the port snap collection the ports collection it'll verify the integrity of the files and then it will update them where they need to be updated now once you've done that you'll have to go back and recompile any of the apps that you've used that you've installed in order to benefit from those updates that's the bad thing about about using compiled software is that when you update it, you have to recompile it. There's usually no other way around it. If FreeBSD ever gets the package system working properly, then we'll be able to use that instead. And those are pre-compiled binaries, which means we can update a lot easier than we can with compiled files. So with that said, that's a brief run through of ports, how to get it up and running. Um, let's save looking at how to actually compile something for another episode because we are out of time for this week. Thanks for tagging along with me. Hope you enjoyed the episode. As always, I welcome your feedback and suggestions and comments. And in fact, I want to give a shout out to Scott B., who corrected me on pronunciation from Terminal Tinkering Episode 1 when I talked about Linux distributions on the Power Mac. Just to maybe drill it into my own memory, uh, the correct pronunciation is Debian and OpenSUSE. So if you have any other feedback, comments, questions, suggestions, or just want to chat, reach out to me on email at jeffb at macobserver.com or on Twitter as at Clefmeister. Until next time, keep tinkering and have fun.